Welcome back to Count Me In. I'm your host, Adam Larson, and today we have an extraordinary episode lined up for you. I had the pleasure of sitting down with Brett Kelly, the brilliant founder of Kelly Partners, a global accounting firm. Brett shares his inspiring journey from his early days in Australia to leading a successful business with a global presence. We delve into how early setbacks and significant influences propelled him forward. Brett also offers valuable insights into the power of mission-driven work, the importance of aligning your personal values with your career, and the impact of building a supportive team environment. Whether you're in accounting or simply passionate about leadership and success, Brett's story and wisdom are sure to captivate and inspire you. So sit back and enjoy this incredible conversation. Well, Brett, I'm really excited to have you on the Count Me In podcast. And I figured just to get started, maybe we could uh, just hear a little bit about your story and how you've gotten to where you are, because you are you run a very successful organization, and I'm sure it just didn't start there. And so I figure we could start just by talking a little bit about your story. I don't know. Problem. I grew up in Australia, one of eight boys. I left. I, I, my father had a business in 1990 in the middle of the, the last great recession in Australia. I haven't had one since 1990, 1991. Um, interest rates went to 18% and his internal accountant in his business embezzled a whole bunch of money. That caused an enormous problem for the business and I watched my father fire about 30% of his long-time team members, many of which had been with him more than 20 years. I was going to go and study law, but instead I thought, you know, I'll go and study accounting because it had been my intention to go into business. So I went to Pricewaterhouse at 18 as an undergraduate cadet. I was a kid who'd come first in, in, in everything and captain sporting teams and things. And, um, and I enjoyed my nearly five years there. I joined an investment bank in corporate advisory and lost my job because I didn't fit in with other people. And that led me to read two books that my dad gave me, Think and Grow Rich and How to Win Friends and Influence People. One, Think and Grow Rich said, meet people that have been successful and ask them what they did. And the second said that, you know, it's very important to know how to work well with people. And so I took those lessons, wasn't sure what I wanted to do. And so I wrote to 80 prominent Australians. I said, dear Mr. Hawke, former Australian Prime Minister, so President for your for your um, listeners here in, in the US, and, um, and said, my name's Brett Kelly, I'm 22, I'm unemployed, but I'm keen to learn if you'll spend an hour with me answering my 11 questions on Australia today, yes, in the future, then I will, um, you know, collate a book and get that book out to other young people. I made five and a half thousand phone calls in three months, and I got those people, 34 of them, to speak to me. When I'd gone to the publishing companies and asked them whether they would publish the book, they said, Brett, you, you know, you won't get the people to talk to you. I was 22. I was unemployed with no experience, no expertise, no funding, no idea, to be fair. And um, when I went back three months later with eight months, I up in a bunch of Libra art files and said, okay, I've got the people. What should I do? They said, you're not Ray Martin or Philip Adams. So who would listen to your, you know, who would want to read your book? You know, there's 800 new books released a week. This is a very competitive industry. How will your book stand out? And so for your listeners, you know, that Ray Martin and Philip Adams is sort of Larry King and, you know, um, Howard Stern, mm -hmm. you know, the TV and radio people in Australia. And I said, well, you know, if you're 22 and unemployed and write a book rather than go on unemployment benefits, maybe that's a story. They didn't agree. So I started researching people that had been successful self-publishing and I found the gentleman that had published Chicken Soup for the Soul, mm -hmm. who were um, Mark Victor Hansen, and he had put together a 24 cassette tape series of how to successfully publish a book and a workbook. So I bought that from the US, about $1,000, sent it to Australia, and I essentially just followed what the book said to do. I raised $21,000 to print 5,000 books, and then you know, that person, Ray Martin, who they said um, I wasn't, I got him into my book. He put the book on TV and within 24 hours we sold the books and the books were, you know, the book was a number one bestseller. Off the back of that, I did, you know, about 2,000 professional speaking engagements, was the youngest professional speaker in Australia. Mm. And then I went back into the accounting industry. I wasn't sure what I wanted to do, but I knew that accountants were really in a privileged position and could make a real difference, but often they didn't. Mm. And so I thought, well, instead, maybe I could go into that industry, which, you know, is very certain, like death and taxes. And, you know, in all likelihood, we'll, you know, we could make a difference. I went through three small firms and those small firms 
showed me something very interesting. I thought, you know, why do they keep promising me partnership, but, you know, then pulling out? And, you know, I, I thought they were bad people and maybe they were, but what they really were were partners in a, a firm, smaller firms that were disorganized like most private business owners. They would make a promise that they then couldn't keep because they really didn't have a finance team or anyone to advise them on how they would do a transition of their equity or succession in their firm. And so they kept making promises that they couldn't keep to me and basically the rest of the industry. And, and what I identified was that succession was a huge issue in the industry, that partners in accounting firms, particularly smaller firms, didn't have a system or really any idea how to do that effectively. And that there was an opportunity if you could get the older guys and younger guys to work well together by basically becoming a specialist in, in the succession of accounting firms. So in 2006, we started Kelly Partners, mm. you know, with one small office, four people, 200,000 in billings. Today, we bill about 120 million a year. We, we're on track to be about the 16th or 17th largest firm in Australia. And we've got an office um, in Hong Kong, one in Mumbai, and now two here in Los Angeles, where I've been based for the last 16 months. And so our, you know, our ambition is to build Australia's first and only global accounting firm for private mm. business owners that, what, that want to be, be global be, and be successful on that basis. And um, we're doing that one step at, time, at a time. Adam, in 2017, in June, we listed Kelly Partners Group Holdings, which is the holding company of our group on the Australian Stock Exchange. And if you bought a share in June 2007, it would have cost you $1 and today it'll cost you 7 So investors have had a 7.4 times return on their money, which is the best return, you know, that um, investors have probably had from a publicly listed accounting group. That's an amazing story. And to see that growth and that journey, you know, it's not your typical journey. A lot of times people try to go to like a big time accounting firm and then they find their way and then eventually go to, but the fact that you were able to, you know, I need to move on. I need to do something different. And the, you talk to all these successful people and found what it meant to be successful. And then we're actually able to apply it. You know, that's a, that's a huge story. Not everybody's able to talk to those people and then actually do something about it. Cause sometimes you, you might hear somebody say, oh, this is what I did to be successful, but then you don't know how to apply it in your life. And and, you know, what, what was that catalyst that was able to say, okay, I, I, you talked to all these great people, you, you did the book, the book was successful. How are you able to convert all of those great, that great advice into actually applying it in your life? Cause that's not a one, two, three step. It's not a simple uh, task at all. Yeah. Adam, I, I was asked when I was 22, I'd written this best selling book. I was doing a lot of speaking and people would ask me, they would say, Brett, typically when something very bad happens to somebody like you lose your job, that affects people badly psychologically why was it that you were able to just sort of pick up and, you know, go again? And I said, well, there was a couple of reasons. One, I was very lucky. Mm. You know, my dad, who's now dead, was my number one supporter. You know, I had somebody that loved me. And I do think that in terms of the core character and, and belief that people take into their lives, being loved by a parent or, you know, a grandparent or someone is very helpful unconditionally. You know, dad was always like, if you're good to people, and you work harder than anyone else, then um, you're likely to be able to achieve whatever you want to achieve. And so, you know, I had, as, I, as I've as i reflected on it, I knew I had that. He, my mum really believed in education. You know, she was the one that would sit you down, make you read your, your reading list and, and learn your spelling. And I came to learn that, you know, if you, through this journey, if you read a book a week, you've got a pretty big advantage because, you know, there's this great American speaker, Jim Rohn, who says that education will make you a living and self-education will make you a fortune. Mm. And most Australians and Americans read one book a year, on average 18 pages of that book. And so you can outperform the cohort by reading and reading can really take you from wherever you are to where you want to be. Now, I didn't have in my life, my next door neighbor or a guy across the street who was a billionaire or a president or had become an Olympian. But through the power of books, I could access any person that I thought I could learn from mm. or I thought that could teach me something or I thought that maybe I wanted to operate in that area. Now, my, I was lucky in that I discovered that your mission, you know, your real vocation, what's in your heart, you know, what you were born for, the difference you're trying to make, that you're really born to make. If you can create some alignment, you know, my friend James King has written a book called Accelerating Excellence. It's a tremendous book for, for people that are listening. And it talks about concordance as sort of the bottom of the pyramid of high performance. He has a master's degree in high performance, ex-SAS soldier, runs the SAS selection process for the British Army. 
And he talks about in order to, to get mastery at something, you need to be in a concordant place with the, doing the thing that you were born to do. And that gives you the internal energy, what he calls the psychological firepower, to be able to take the pain that it takes to be a master at something. Mm -hmm. So to do 10,000 hours or 100,000 hours at something is very painful. Steve Jobs said that, you know, only the the crazy is successful because nobody else would put up with the pain that's required. That's my bad uh, summary of his commentary. (laughs) But, you know, I keep hearing these sort of little snippets, if you like, of wisdom from people. And I know that it's true that the people that can just do the work because they love what they're doing mm. and they're in a place where they can really put their gifts, you know, in the service, you know, to the service of other people. That creates a flywheel where every time you make an effort, you get good feedback. Um, it makes you feel good internally. It might, might not look good, good on Instagram, mind you, because the pain's not, not that attractive. Yeah. And then you do the work and you get good feedback. So you do more work and that builds up this momentum and that momentum really becomes unstoppable. The core of that is wanting to use your gifts and talents for the benefit of other people. And so to the degree that you're motivated in that in that way, Mm -hmm. you really don't need to do much because your internal, you know, what James calls your psychological firepower. I never had that term up until about 18 months ago, Adam. I couldn't explain it to people. I just say just your vibe. Because people would say, Brett, you got so much energy. (laughs) And I'm like, well, not really. I'm just doing the thing that I feel like I'm meant to be doing. Mm. It's very easy to do that thing even though it's very hard often to do, you know, the hard yards, yeah. I'm not having to convince myself that it's worthwhile. Yeah. And I think the key thing there is, is sometimes a lot of people are looking for that get rich quick that like, oh, what, what are the three steps I can take? But that three steps work for that person. You have to, you have to glean from what that they learn from that and see how you can apply it to your own life. Because it's so easy to say, oh, I'm going to follow those steps and I'll do the same thing. Well, your journey is not my journey is not the next person's journey. No. We all have to find our own way. And I think that's, I think that's a great thing to remember as you're, as we're all trying to figure out what we're doing with our lives or we're, you know, seeing what the next thing in our journey is. Yeah, so school really rewards the person that's balanced, Mm -hmm. but life really rewards the person that's not balanced. Yeah. So right order is more important than balance. And the key to that right order is that you're doing the thing that you feel like in your heart and your soul is uniquely the thing that you're, you know, meant to do with your life. Mm -hmm. And that takes a lot of courage because mostly, and I can, can tell you for certain that you know, mostly when you do that, that threatens other people that have been too timid to do the thing that they have really got on their own heart that they should do with their lives. Mm-hmm. People who aren't prepared to commit, won't do the hours, don't want to cop the pain. Um, and when they see you, you know, it's like the fat guy who's married to a fat woman and fat guy decides to get skinny and the fat woman gets upset or vice versa. You know, when you really decide to do the thing that you're meant to do, you will get up very early and you will stay up very late and you'll work six days a week and that will threaten a lot of other people that have a job. Mm -hmm. Most people have a job. That's a thing that they don't like, that somebody gives them some money for doing. You know, a vocation, a a mission, if you like, is a thing that, you know, is in your heart that you just cannot die without doing Mm -hmm. and no one really needs to pay you to do that. But when you start doing that, you should understand that you're going to cop a lot of criticism and, it, you know, and it will be firstly from people that you don't expect, but, but it will be from family and friends and it will be very lonely as you pursue, you know, the genuine path that, um, mm-hmm. that, that, you, that you should. Now, the great news is that there's a jet stream of uh, power, if you like, that, that, that the planes up in the sky flying and it's true for you and me that if you – can put yourself, your psychology first, your mindset, and then your actions mm-hmm. in the place where you're meant to be operating. There's this unseen power that will just push you along. So it's not self-made man business or self-made woman. It's um, putting yourself in the right place. Interestingly, Adam, after I wrote my first book, Collective Wisdom, I've written four other books, but four of them are in a series of books on wisdom, second book, universal wisdom, third business owner's wisdom, fourth investment wisdom. The second one, universal wisdom, looks at seven people that changed the world and why. Mm. Um, So like Warren Buffett and uh, changed the investment world and people like Nelson Mandela and Mother Teresa, Gandhi, you know, what is it that made them able to do what they did? And what I worked out was that they were sitting in this jet stream of power where they were just doing what was right. And so 
and and in particular right for them what they were meant to be doing Mm -hmm. and so so these unstoppable forces not because they have this individual personal power but they're just sitting in that jet stream if you like yeah you know gandhi one guy walking across india you know unstoppable force when he's just this tiny little dude right so if you take those big ideas and you put them into your life and then your career understanding that you know first you're born you're a person then you go into business then you build wealth then you die you want to control who gets the money and what they use it for that that life journey is re- really can't start with any great power and certainly business can't without a leader or founder that is that is mission-based not mercenary based. So mm. the core of Kelly Partners is we're a mission based organization self seeking to help private business owners. And these are the people that employ 70% of all Americans, all Australians, all people in developed countries to be what we call better off, healthy, wealthy, and wise. We believe that if we make the business owning family healthier, wealthier, and wise, that they are likely to treat their people, clients, and community better. Mm. Now, I was raised to believe that, you know, as a bleeding heart, that we should go and help the most junior person in an organization. And and that's true. We should do all of that. But the reality is that when the boss makes a mistake, he doesn't fire himself, he fires the junior. And so what we should do is make sure the boss doesn't make mistakes so we can employ more juniors and build build businesses that provide more and more, you know, dignified employment for more and more people. So that's the mission of the business. From, a, from our team members' point of view, we know that we can create an environment where they can do their best work, where their human dignity can be respected and their full flourishing of their talents can be unleashed. And they're, they're all high, high ideals, but, you know, you can't achieve a high ideal if you don't have one. Mm. So if you get three quarters to a high ideal, you're a lot further, further and better off than if you've got low ideals or none at all. And so we knew that if we got the people right, And we got our systems and processes right. And we knew that we just specialized in one type of client that we were likely to build an organization that could really make make a positive impact. I think what really impressed me when I was looking at your website, your values, you know, we want what's best for others, one team, one way, and we do what we say. That's so simple, but yet it understands the value of of, uh, us as humans. Because a lot of times in business, the human part of it is very much just a number or they're just a line item or a capital expense or something like that. But they're not, we don't truly value the actual people who we work for. And I think I really appreciated that in your, um, in the values that you have as an organization. Well, Adam, the reality is that the only thing with unlimited ability to grow within your business is is your people. Mm -hmm. And so I always say that if you go up to a photocopier, you pick up the manual, it'll say that it can do 30, 40, or 50 pages a minute. And whether you cuddle it or you kick it or you slap it or you shout at it, right, or or you talk kindly to it, it can't outperform its manual. But all of the people in your organization, and certainly your clients in the community, but every person you meet, most of them have never met a billionaire, a president, a person that's changed the world. They never met Gandhi. They have no idea of the human potential that is within them. Yeah. And so then within a business that has the most leverage is unpacking the full capacity of your people. And so if you've got a clear idea of, you know, what are the highest qualities of a person? So we want people that are other people centered, not self centered. Mm-hmm. Because all things relationship. So let's get those people first, people that keep their promises or die, and people that know that a team can do more than an individual. If you think about who you want to date, who you want to be married to, who you want to work with, who you want to have as a friend, who you want to have as part of a community, who you want to have as your next door neighbor, they are three universal ideas that you want in every single person you interact with. And they're very high ideals. But if you can get those types of people around you, mm. end up as people and you put them in the right environment, those people have the ability to unleash an unbelievable amount of firepower. Mm-hmm. And so that's, you know, we start with a person uh, within our organization, but then when we work with clients, we think the same way. Imagine if you thought, right, we're going to select our clients on the basis of people who want the best for others, who keep their promises and know that we can be part of their team and make a difference. You would, again, have a very different type of client. Mm. And so, you know, life is short and who you spend your time with matters. And so if you get the right people in your team, you get the right clients in your life and you get the right community members around you, 
then you build this flywheel of, of good fun, frankly, good values, good fun, where, you know, you never really feel like it work mm. because what you're in fact doing is prosecuting a mission that has a huge amount of meaning and can make a real difference. Yeah. So that's the game, you know, they're very, it's a philosophical first approach. And then you come to the accounting industry and you know that at the heart of government, in order to be the government, you have to be able to pay the army. You can't pay the army if you don't have a tax system. So you know that taxes will last forever and that the tax system is critically important. It's not going away. And that people need to make sure that they have the right representation so that they can pay the right amount of tax, but not, you know, not more tax than, than they are due to pay. And so you know that there's a real place there where you can make a difference. And importantly, most accounting firms, they haven't, haven't got a sense of mission. They don't have a, a clear set of values. They don't have a clear vision as to how they can change the industry. In terms of strategy, they're not clear on the type of client that they can most serve. Mm-hmm. They kind of have to take a fee from anyone for anything. And then finally, the way we structure our firms, they're 51, 49 partnerships with people that have agreed to hang around for a minimum term of 10 years. And so we've got long-term oriented people with the right type of structure. Now, if you get all of that right, you can really go at the operational aspects of, um, of the business in quite a different way. We have a central services team of 35 people that work across people, process, clients, financial, brand, digital operations, risk, succession. And that means that the partners have a team of people that can execute on the things that they know should be happening within these firms. So it's a very different model that we brought to the market, but it's been very successful. We've grown at 30% a year on average every year for 18 years in a row. Mm. So it's twice as profitable as the industry, and they use one third of the working capital, and our system returns about 25% of partner time to the partners. So when you think about you know, what we've done, 80 plus transactions today, where we built partnerships across 36 locations, across four different countries. We're on our way to becoming Australia's global accounting firm, but we still know that uh, there's a lot of work ahead of us. You know, it's a, a, as Jim Collins would say, it's a long march and, you know, we've got a 25 year big area audacious goal as to, as to what we think we can achieve together and the difference that it can make. Yeah, I, I, what I appreciate about your perspective is, is you, your, your goal is to make a difference. And I think that not a lot of accounting firms, even accounting and finance teams, that's not really their goal. It's like, let's make sure the numbers look right. Let's make sure we're doing, like we talk about data visualization. We talk about a lot of the to-do things, but our overarching goal should be to make a difference in the world. And what, what advice would you give to people who are in accounting and finance firms who are in the industry and they're like, I like what you're saying, but how can I make a difference when I'm just, you know, maybe doing some of these taxes or I'm, you know, I'm, I'm in the you know, FP&A realm where I'm, you know, just doing data visualization. How can I make a difference in that, in that role? Yeah. So interestingly, Adam, um, you can think of it in a few ways. You'll experience life with the mentality that you bring to it. You typically get what you give. My dad used to always say, you get what you give. If you smile at someone, they'll smile back. Mm -hmm. If you're kind to somebody, they'll be kind back. So if you put energy into something, you'll lift the energy of the people around you. So firstly, be a leader in the position that you find yourself And then secondly, you can look me up on the internet or Twitter and send me a message and we'll see what we can do for you. Because fundamentally, what I learned in my first book is that you become the person you spend the most time with, right? Mm. So if you've got, you you know, if you write a list across a page of the seven people that you spend the most time with, and then you write healthy, wealthy, and wise down, and you give each of those people a score for health, wealth, and wisdom, you make yourself a little grid, you'll end up the average of those seven people. Mm. So if you're in an organization where you spend 50, 60 hours a week, you know, most of your, your waking hours, and you look around and you say, these are not people that have the, a sense of mission, values, or vision that resonates with me. Mm-hmm. And frankly, if um, I grow up to be like them, that'll be a waste of my life. Then you need to find other people that share your values. And so you can always drop me a note on Twitter or, or find my email. And I'd be happy to help. But in all seriousness, your life is dramatically impoverished if you spend your time with people that don't inspire you, that don't ask you to be better, that don't encourage you to be the best that you can be. And we only get one life. As I love to say, you know, my favorite quote, Adam, is time is limited and death is certain. Hmm. So I'm very serious about how I use that limited time that I have. You know, while I take the mission seriously, you know, we don't take ourselves too seriously. Mm-hmm. 
Well, Brett, I really appreciate you spending some of your limited time with us today on this podcast. And I appreciate the insights you brought to our audience. And I just uh, really excited that we got to chat today. Adam, I really appreciate your interest. And I'm always happy to make time for, for, a, for a good chat. And I hope it's been helpful for you. And, and I hope it will be helpful for your listeners. This has been Count Me In, IMA's podcast, providing you with the latest perspectives of thought leaders from the accounting and finance profession. If you like what you heard and you'd like to be counted in for more relevant accounting and finance education, visit IMA's website at www.imanet.org.